Good evening and salam. I'm Hadra and I am a member of the MacVest team. Welcome all and thank you for joining us from wherever you are in the world for this exciting workshop introducing you to the basics of photography. This is a free workshop but donations are always welcome. This workshop, this workshop session is aimed at both newcomers to digital photography and also those using mobile phone cameras. We will first look at ways to improve the quality and creativity of your photos. Then look at some photographs from a new book to be published soon, Curry Mile to Shisha Mile. We're honored to be joining um, award-winning free, freelance photographer, Phil, For Phil Portis, <laughs> apologies. Phil Portis is a professional freelance uh, photographer based in Manchester. He specializes in portraits, street photography, and does occasional commercial commissions. Over the last few years, he has been working with another photographer and uh, Hanif Boba from the Ethnic Health Forum, Russia and for the Curry Mile project, documenting everyday life in the Curry Mile. Before I hand over to Phil, I would like the audience to please follow MacFest on social media. That's our Facebook, Instagram and Twitter, so you're informed of our next events. Thank you and over to you, Phil. There we go. Hello. Th thank you. Thank you for a wonderful introduction there. I'll try and live up to the words you've said. Um, yes. Um, uh, welcome, everybody who's joined us today. And um, as, as you've been told, I'm going to uh, uh, go through some basics of photography and look at a new book, which uh, I'm producing with somebody else, Mike Baker, um, about the Curry Mile. So there'll be lots of photographs. And, uh, and also, uh, you can also, I'll give you opportunities to, uh, to ask questions at various points, uh, though I think you can, uh, you can send in questions to um, MacFest uh, as you think of, think of them as we go along. Um, so, and if anybody wants any sort of further information or there's a question which requires a, a lengthy answer, um, you'll see my email address at the end and you can always email me and I'll happily uh, explain things in more detail. So I need to bring something up here now. There we go. Okay, um, I'm, I'm starting with the, the, the first part of the talk uh, in connection with uh, creative photography for beginners. Um, and then I'm going to follow with the, uh, the pictures from the Curry Mile project. Uh, and there's a good reason for that because um, um, some of the photographs in the first part are from the Curry Mile project. But when I talk about the photographs in the, in the second part along uh, Curry Mile, I can make reference to some of the things I've talked about in the first part, if you follow what I mean. Anyway, um, so, uh, photography uh, is, is something I've done all my life, and uh, and it's something which uh, you need to have a little bit of um, knowledge about to to get the best pictures. But um, there is a, a saying in the photographic world, and I've got an expensive camera, and people, other photographers, have even more expensive cameras or more equipment than I've got, but. There is a saying that the best camera there is, is the one that you have at that very moment when you need to take that picture um, of, of somebody smiling, a baby doing something really interesting, something out in the street. And for most people, it's a mobile phone. And the same for me, I don't carry my expensive camera around when I'm walking around Manchester. I sometimes carry a small camera, um, but I've always got a mobile phone. So um, there we go. Okay, um, as I'm um, saying, the, this is really for people who have got cameras or digital cameras or getting uh, are going to get a digital camera. And, and maybe people who've been using mobile phones want to move on to try things a bit more detail and a bit more professional. But I'm gonna keep re making reference to mobile phones because I know everybody has one. Okay, the whole range of equipment uh, can be very techy, and uh, I don't want to go into, into the ins and outs of each camera, but um, 
the top camera is say, say like my camera and this costs um, thousands of pounds three three and a half thousand pounds which seems a lot of money but um, when you have a musical instrument people will spend uh, tens of thousands of pounds on a violin so it means you can get the best out of it and, and if I'm getting paid for a job, I need to, to guarantee I can get the uh, results from my camera. But you don't need that. The middle camera, the uh, entry level, these can cost less than a thousand pounds with lenses. If you have a point and shoot camera, they can take pictures, but um, it, you can't really adjust the picture to be creative. And that's what we're talking about in this session. And everybody's got a mobile phone um, and uh, they are, I mean, I've got my phone here in my pocket. It's a, a Pixel, uh, a, a Google Pixel 2. It's, I think the, the Pixel 5 is out now, so it's out of date, but it still takes quite good pictures for the, the general things which I might use. But I certainly couldn't sell those pictures and, um, and I don't use them generally for some of the work I do. Anyway, um, Okay, good pictures and not so good pictures. Um, on the left is one of mine, which um, uh, Keith Slade, a conductor, came to me and said, um, I want some promotion pictures. And I took several pictures like this. And it's in, it's in a little studio in my uh, studio in Disbury. And um, came along and he wanted some really good action pictures. So he, uh, he brought along a CD of Tchaikovsky's Second Symphony. He also brought, brought the music, the conductor's music. And he had that in front of him. You can't see it in this picture. And we played the CD and he was conducting to the music. And I was taking pictures. But um, I, I wanted him to be more expressive. So I, but, but jokingly, I said, um, Keith, bring in the ukuleles. And uh, he would be expressive and, and then bring in the banjos, Keith, and he would do something slightly different or make everything quiet. And he would do all the those. So I had a variety of poses. So that's how I would work, working really hard on getting that um, those things in that picture. Um, the one on the right is a typical picture, which um, I'm, I'm sure I've taken one as well, where your thumb is over the lens, especially on phone cameras, but also the people are dark, the faces are not lit properly, they're cut off, so it really doesn't work that. So, okay, uh, we want to try and improve things. We don't want blurred images. Again, that's something which uh, sort of shaky pictures. We need to control this. Something else, here's a, a picture. I must add, it's not my picture. I, uh, I had to find a picture which was a really bad photograph and if, uh, we ha if, if I was in a classroom now, I used to be a teacher, um, I would have been asking, right, okay, Gary, uh, what's wrong with this one? And, uh, and Jane, what's wrong with this? Or, um, or Kezra, what's wrong with this? And obviously there's a few things there. The horse's head is mo mostly cut off. There are a few people appearing at the, the rear of the, the horse. That doesn't look good. The... Um, the people on the cart, um, well, the cart is sort of cut off as well. So the whole, and it's cluttered, everything's cluttered in the background. So it's, it's just not a good photograph. So that's what we want to try and do is to find out how we can improve things. Okay, now it's obvious what's wrong with this photograph. And most people have taken one where something is appearing at the back of somebody's head. It could be a tree. Um, it could be a pole, this is a chimney, I think, and um, it, it just looks awful. Now, I'm going to tell you how those kind of photographs can be avoided. Yes, don't stand in front of objects which grow out of people's head or somewhere. Um, make sure the back of the picture is, is out of focus, and that way um, you're just concentrating on the subject, the, the man there. Also, a flash went off on the camera. And you can see in the, the bottom right hand corner, a day glow sign, which has uh, just picked the flash up and thrown it back at the camera. Really distracting, no good. Okay, some basics. I'll go through this 
quite quickly and try to uh, make reference to this in the photographs I'll show you afterwards. So we're concentrating on the, the visuals rather than the theory, but um, this theory you do need to think about, and you can always look this up on, um, uh, on, on YouTube. There's dozens of little courses on this, but uh, things about the exposure triangle. There are three things that you need to think about. Uh, when you just have a, an auto camera, an auto phone, you just click the button and all these things are done for you. But sometimes they don't do it well. So we've got uh, the aperture. That's the size of the hole in the, in the, le in the, in the lens. Um, and that determines the amount of light that's going through. So as you can imagine, a large aperture, a lot of light small aperture, a small amount of light. I know that's simplistic, but you do need to have that at the back of your mind. The shutter speed. Um, a lens in traditional cameras would have had a mechanical shutter, and that would have been something that exposed the film and, uh, and then stopped exposing the film. So it could be a fraction of a second. It could be a 60th of a second. It could be a thousandth of a second. It could even be right down to one second or two seconds. And that determines the amount of light that's coming in. So what we're doing is we're controlling the amount of light that gets onto the sensor in the camera. Uh, the word ISO, I'll, come, I'll explain that in a minute, but it's the international standards. It's about how sensitive your camera is. And you can set that sensitivity. This is the same thing, um, just, uh, so you can see that with fast shutter speed, you have less exposure, slow shutter speed, you have more exposure. Like I've been saying, um, big aperture, small aperture. And there's also the ISO, they use these numbers and I'll explain that in a moment. Okay, um, again, a bit techy here, but uh, it's something you do need to know um, that uh, when you're looking at setting the, the camera to do specific things, you need to know what the, the size of this hole is, the aperture. And it's given a, uh, a number, it's called the F number. And it's an it's a inverse ratio number, it's a ratio number. So when you've got a small number, you've got a big hole. And when you've got a, uh, a big number, you've got a small hole. So it's a bit like saying um, um, uh, something one over 100, 1%. Uh, it's very, very small, but it's a big number, isn't it? It's one over a hundred. But if something is, is like a, a half, then it's, uh, uh, it's a smaller number. Um, but it's, it's something which you have to uh, try to remember. And once you start using it, you realize that a 2.8 lens is good for portraits and an F11 lens is good for uh, landscapes. So I'll come back to that in other ways. Again, cameras have auto or they can have manual, and that's what I'm talking about now. And again, um, a lot more words here, but things which you do need to uh, think about when you're trying to do creative photography. So uh, auto mode, you can imagine everything's on auto. The focus, uh, you just point it at the person or the landscape, and it focuses on the nearest thing. Um, the aperture, it works out the best aperture. Uh, the shutter speed, everything is done for you, but it may not be what you want in the end. There's another thing called white balance, and that's to do with the, uh, the type of light. And um, sometimes if you photograph, take a photograph in a, inside, pictures can look a bit yellow. Um, um, so, so it's a way of adjusting that. So quite often that's done automatically. So you, you perhaps don't need to think about that too much. The manual, the photographer sets everything. Uh, but as a professional photographer, I'll still have autofocus uh, unless I'm doing something which I've got to focus on one specific thing. Um, but cameras are very sophisticated and you can um, play around with all these things. Um, okay, a few examples. Okay, uh, aperture, if it's a small aperture, and a big number, 22, F22, you can take, um, everything is in focus from the foreground right through to the paraglider, which you might just be able to see in the distance there. 
they're all in focus. And um, so that's a good way of, of doing landscapes. Whereas if you want to take a portrait of somebody, you don't want things confusing the background. And, um, and this way you use a lens which you set it to something like 2.8 or less if you can. Now you can see on this one that behind his head, there is a little bit of a black window. And if it was all in focus, that would have just blended into his hair. Now, because I've thrown all the back out of focus, then it just becomes part of a, um, an out of focus background. So, um, and also with this, um, uh, this image here, I, I've made sure the eyes are very clear. There's a, what we call a catch light in the eyes, a little sort of little, little bead of light in each eye, which um, makes it look, uh, come to life. Um, th this was taken, he's one of the barbers that I took photographs of along Curry Mile. So I got a few photographs from there as well in this first part. Um, the shutter speed, how fast does the, um, the shutter open and close? At the very top of that uh, sheet there, that slide, you can see a hammer, um, several photographs of a hammer uh, while it's moving. And in the very left-hand side, one a thousandth of a second, you can hardly see the movement at all. But as you go slower and slower shutter speeds, then it's really, really blurred at a quarter or half a second. So that's a good example, a good way of explaining it. Um, the, this photograph of mine here, uh, this woman is at one of these events called Tough Mudder, and uh, it, it, she's paid probably a hundred pounds to spend two or three hours walking around, running around, swimming around dirty, slippy, muddy rivers and uh, ponds and things. And uh, it's great for photography because they, the, they don't mind their photographs being taken and uh, you get some good ones like this, but all the water droplets are, are absolutely sort of frozen in that sense. They're, they're still, because it was a fast shutter speed of a thousandth of a second. The, the next one, um, this is uh, in, in Naples, in Italy, and I wanted the movement of the train. So I, I took the speed down to about a fifteenth of a second, held it really still, or propped myself up against something, and gently pressed the trigger. The man was just waiting dead still, so he, he, he doesn't show the movement. Okay, um, this, this thing about the sensitivity of the, uh, the camera sensor, uh, it's, it's referred to as an ISO number, but that's just a, uh, a standard number, which is the same around the world. So if you're taking detailed pictures, then you want something of a, a, a low value. So it's very detailed, like, um, the landscape there of the trees, and um, and that would blow up to a, a very large picture if you, you wanted. Whereas the lot, the bottom picture, because uh, I, I I like jazz, I, I take photographs of jazz musicians, and uh, this was taken at quite a high speed because I've caught her just expressing the singer there as she's singing something, and. Uh, but it's taken with a very high ISO value. And you can't probably see it on here, but it's quite a grainy picture. And, uh, but that's quite nice for uh, sort of jazz clubs, uh, jazzy type pictures like that. Okay, so all these things go through my mind when I'm taking a so-called creative picture. Uh, on mobile phones, a lot of these settings are auto and on point and shoot cameras. So you don't have to think about them. But on Android and Apple apps, sorry, on the, on the phones, you can get certain apps which give you control over the shutter speed, the ISO white balance. So um, that is possible to make your phone into a, um, a manual camera. Um, a little tip here is to, is to make sure that you uh, clean your lenses. And um, I'm just gonna just turn in my phone off, there we go. Um, make sure you clean your lenses because 
you keep these phones, you keep them in your pocket or a bag or somewhere, and uh, they, they can get really mucky. So uh, it's a simple way, because on my expensive camera, I have a very, I have a, an expensive piece of glass to go over the expensive lens, so it doesn't get damaged. But every now and again, I will clean it with a, a microporous cloth. So um, you should be doing the same with your, your phones. And try to avoid using the digital zoom on mobile phones because uh, all it does is just blow up the, um, uh, the pixels and makes it um, uh, not, not as good picture as a, um, a zoom which uses proper glass lenses. Uh, so there is a difference there. Okay. Um, now I, I could, uh, could uh, just ask are there, uh, any questions about the, uh, the exposure triangle. Have we got any specific questions? Anybody? Not at the moment in the chat. Not at the moment. Right. Okay. Well, you're, 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 it's either gone right over your head or... <laughs> So um, I'm learning but, a lot. I'm a total beginner, Phil. Thank you. But, but, well, well, good. And th thank you, Kaiser. And uh, there is a lot in this, but um, it's, and it's quite a, a tall order to, to do something like this in a, an hour and a bit uh, and sh show you all the, uh, the other photographs as well. So um, I'm happy for people to get back to me on that. But um, I, I think if, if it's told you a few things that you, you need to look up the exposure triangle on YouTube and look at a few YouTubes, you will probably get more out of it because you've heard me talk a little bit about it. Okay, the, the next important thing is composition. Now, I love going to art galleries when I can, and I'm looking forward to the Manchester Mosley Street Art Gallery opening. And any time I go to a capital city or anywhere, I always go to the art gallery or the, the art museum or whatever. And I love looking at paintings. I like painting myself, but I like looking at classic pictures and how they've been composed. And from that, I can use that to give me ideas for composing my own photographs. So composition is how you put all these things together. So let's have a look. And there's lots of ideas of composition. There's a, and I'm only gonna mention a few but uh, I'll, I'll talk about these as we go through. There's one called the rule of thirds. And I'm gonna to go to the next picture. I think it's easier to sit, tell on a picture. Okay, now, as I said, I like painting, but I didn't do this one. This is a famous one by, by Turner. And um, uh, it's the, the fighting uh, Temeraire. And it's, it's a very good picture in the sense that it's looking at how um, new technology, the, uh, uh, the steam tug, is towing the grey looking sailing ship. And uh, that can apply to all sorts of things uh, today. It's not the, uh, uh, the Suez Canal uh, where the tug's trying to unblock the canal. It's not that picture. So in this one here, you can see um, it's been divided into uh, nine uh, square, nine rectangles with those equally spaced lines. So you can see the the tug and the sailing ship are roughly in that bottom third intersection. And that's a good place to look at it. Uh, it could be over on the right hand side, but he's chosen to put it there. And, uh, and the rule of thirds is something good, which you can always do. And I'll show you a few examples. Now, this is a photograph of mine I took in the 70s when I was doing a, um, a documentary project and um, this, that, that all the houses in this part of Salford, they were being pulled down, it was clearance. And um, all the houses were empty except his. And he was very conscious that um, uh, children may come along and throw stones at the window. And so you can't see it clearly here, but the, the thing in the window says, uh, this house is occupied. And um, he, he, so he was waiting to be moved into uh, some, some flats nearby. But um, so I was chatting to him and uh, he said he used to be a photographer when he was younger. And he gave all his photographs to the, uh, uh, the Salford um, Archive, the museum. So I said, can I take your photograph? So he was happy for me to do that. And he stood in the doorway and 
because he knew a bit of something about photography, he knew that it's also a good idea not always to look at the camera, but just to look away. So he was looking down the street as if he was conscious of uh, kids or some uh, somebody going to uh, damage the house that he's living in at the moment. Um, and so that's um, one of my favourite pictures. Um, another one which is uh, on the third uh, is this, this place in Robin Hood's Bay in Yorkshire on the coast there. And you can see the, uh, the cross and in the graveyard. And it's also at an angle, which I quite like. It's not straight up. And, and but it, it's also on the left-hand side. So we're looking at a photograph like this. You can see, you look at the cross and then my eye goes down the gravestones and it sort of curves around by the trees and goes out to the bay, to the headland, and then back to the cross again. So there is a way of using composition to direct your eye around a picture. And that's when I go to art galleries, I'm looking, how did that artist um, direct, as, how is that eye, artist going to direct my eye around his painting? And uh, I'll talk about that again as well. Okay, another picture of mine, this, um, I was in London and, um, and my wife and I with her friend, Helen, and I thought I must take a picture of her because she had a yellow dress on and I thought the yellow line there looked really good. So, uh, so Janet was holding her coat and uh, bag and I asked Helen to stand absolutely still and I've got her there on the third and the train is just rushing past and I'm up against the wall at a 15th of a second. She wasn't moving, but the train was, and I was hardly not moving. So that's another example. And also use of colour, the yellow and two connections there. That's, that's called Mind the Gap. Um, another picture, um, uh, again, um, engines, trains, locomotives are popular with some photographers. And uh, I'm also a member of the Manchester South Manchester Camera Club, and I think this was an outing we'd gone to. And um, again, the one, the locomotive on the engine on the left is on the third, and then you've got two other ones. So three numbers here, three items in the picture makes a better picture. Then also in the foreground, you've got these lead-in lines from the light on the polished rails, and that makes you look into the picture, sort of waves and snakes you into the picture. Look, look for those things, and that makes good pictures. This was in Manchester, uh, I don't know, 10 more years ago, 15 years ago. And um, I, I was in a car park. I just got my camera ready. Um, I set it, turned it on. It was over my neck, uh, and I was going to take some photographs around Manchester. And just as I was walking past the pay station, I just saw this vision of vista of colour, these primary colours here, the woman with the red coat on and bag and, and boots, and then the, the blues and the yellows. And the, you can see the, the lines coming in from the, from the blue bits of metal all pointing towards her. Um, so it, it almost looks like a Mondrian painting in some way. And I just took one picture and I walked on. Um, uh, I wasn't imposing upon her really because it, it, I couldn't see her face and uh, uh, I think she would have wondered what I was doing. But uh, again, that's another one of my favourite pictures, but it's a good example of composition. It's a really nice one of the colours, the yellow and the red. <laughs> uh, absolutely. And I think, yes, trying to get strong colour things. And this is an, another colour um, strength picture. Um, this is in, in Staithes, a, a lovely little uh, fishing village on the Yorkshire coast and uh, it's, it's all built on this little sort of headland here, all very close together, tightly um, joined up buildings, all white and bits of red roofs and things. But there's one colour, the blue um, house there, which sort of stands out. And I, when I was thinking of title for it, I thought Blue Harbour House, because that's where my eye goes to straight away. And also the picture is, is sort of composed. The sky is holding it in from the top. The grass on where I'm standing on the headland is holding it in from the bottom. The, um, the dark bay on the, the left is, is not interrupting. And on the right hand side, that's where the sun's coming from. Um, it's still 
it's darkish in that part of the valley and there's a bridge that goes over. So everything is leading to keep the central part of that picture. So uh, again in Yorkshire, um, this is a polytunnel in the winter. There was no polythene on it, but um, uh, uh, I, and, but the tree is on the other side of it. It's, it's not in the polytunnel, it's, it's outside, it's, it's, it's at the end of it. And all the lines lead right down to the tree. So that's an excellent example of lead-in lines. Rivers can be lead-in lines. Parts of roads and pavements are lead-in lines. So if you've got somebody standing there, you can have bits of walls uh, leading towards the person. Um, not a brilliant photograph, but an example of a diagonal line and, and color as well. This is at the uh, Lowry in Salford. And there you can, looking down, um, I've taken pictures here with people sitting down uh, at other times. I suppose ideally there should have been something at the top right hand corner, um, like somebody sitting there um, or something on the table. So it's a, it's a bit barren, but it's a bit, it's a pattern picture. Um, I said things um, in threes or on the third are good. I'm breaking that rule now. And that's what you sometimes have to do is to break rules. Uh, once you know what the rule is, you can break it, but you're doing it for a specific reason. And here I'm putting the thing slap in the middle and I'm using the symmetry uh, of the handrails there and the, uh, the walkway and everything sort of points in towards the base of that lighthouse uh, up in North Wales here. And then you sort of look up the lighthouse and you get to the red top of it. So, and the blue sky sets off the, the red as well. Um, also, if you look, the, the, the proportion of sky to sand is about two thirds sky and one third sand. So I'm trying to keep those sort of um, uh, ideal sort of uh, um, patterns and shapes in like the, the great masters of painting, they use the golden mean, the, these rule of thirds. So um, we have to copy them. Th this is my most recent photograph. Um, uh, being in lockdown over the last 12 months, uh, I haven't been out into Manchester except a couple of weeks ago when I took this picture. And um, uh, so I really like this one because you've got the lead in lines from the, uh, the, the, the rails. Um, and you've got the two trams there. But what I've done with this, I've cheated really. I've made them, uh, I've kept the yellow, but turned the rest of it black and white. So it's a bit like the pictures you may have seen of uh, New York taxis and uh, where they pop, it's called popping the color. So you could do that with telephone boxes or um, uh, whatever. Uh, and the rest of it is black and white. So you concentrate on the color there. Uh, again, another picture to show uh, symmetry, but this time the lead in lines go to um, a, a, a woman there reading a book or something, and it's something more to look at. So that's a, a better example of, uh, well, it's an example of symmetry, lead in lines, and muted colours. It's, it's very similar colours there. They're, it's not too busy. Um, this is a very odd one, and I just put this in because it's very unusual. Um, uh, you, you, you may may guess I come from Liverpool and um, uh, I often go there to take photographs along the waterfront and there's a, uh, a, a, a big conference hall there, like the arena, and um, they have these wind breaks by the doors because it's right on the front of the Mersey and uh, the wind can be pretty strong. So these are just uh, wind breaks they put holes in them so that they don't fall over or bend themselves they just slow down the wind but when you take a photograph right in the middle you get this effect and it's called the moi effect and these are just two parallel sheets of, of metal with holes exactly opposite each, each other but it looks round doesn't it anyway they're, they're optical illusions again looking at dots the the three ladies here uh, um, are singers um, and they came to studio for some promotion pictures and again they've got the same color dress on same pattern and there's three of them which is a good number for for um, for portrait work for uh, for group work 
Uh, five is a good one. Um, and I, to make it more interesting, um, I took lots of pictures, but to make this one more interesting, I just said, just pretend you're telling the, the two women on the right are just talking about the woman on the left, a bit of gossiping or something, just a little story, uh, just made up on the moment. And uh, that, that uh, has done really well in competitions. Uh, so really pleased with that. Um, something else which has done well in, in competitions, um, I was commissioned to take some photographs at a dance studio and, uh, and I set up a small pop-up studio in the place, the white backdrop, studio lights, and I was taking individual, but I like the three, uh, the, the three children together. And uh, uh, this is so, a lot of people think it's so cute because I suppose you could imagine the little girl on the left there is um, uh, the Dame Margot Fontaine, which is going to be that, the, um, the, the Darcy, um, I've forgotten her name now, um, on the left. The one in the middle there, she's a bit shy, a bit gawky. And then the one on the right there is, oh, what's going on? So uh, I just thought there were three different expressions, but three numbers. Again, three. I obviously like three in pictures. And these are musician people I know, promotion pictures. And well, they're using their eyes. They're looking at him as if he's playing some something amazing or a, uh, an odd note. And... Um, I use a wide angle lens, like a fisheye lens, to give, to give this distorted effect. And um, uh, so they came, but they, they didn't have a piano, so you had to use my electric piano here as well, that's mine. Uh, you didn't need to know that. Um, again, have fun, enjoy what you're doing. And, uh, uh, and I, again, another studio shot was um, th this one here on the left. I, I'd taken pictures of uh, Gavin, the bass player, but um, we decided he could hide behind it uh, because, well, just something different. The guys on the right here are at one of these Tough Mudder events and uh, they're just totally enjoying themselves, taken with a long lens and um, 2.8, so just they're just in focus. The boots are out of focus, the, uh, the, the background's out of focus. They're just in focus and that's what you want. So uh, I, I like that one. I, I've made some cards with that for uh, Father's Day. That, that sells quite well sometimes. Okay, um, so that, that's composition. Now there's different types of photography and I don't do them all. I don't do sports photography. Um, I, I don't really do flowers and uh, wildlife, but um, uh, I just thought we'd have a look at a few of these different types, a few of them. Okay, this is a, a landscape uh, I took up in, um, in Scotland. Um, and um, now the thing is, you may think, oh, it's a, a landscape. I had a tripod and, um, and I set it all up. I've got the lead in line of the, of, of the, the hill on the left, the small in the foreground, leading up to a little tree there and up to the, the big tree, the, the bigger tree. So that, that's, and that's sort of on the third, it's, it's more like the fifth, isn't it? But it's towards the right hand side. So that's the, the aim of your little eye movement is to end up at that tree. You go to the background and you can see the hills again are leading you towards the tree. And the very back hills are just being oh, this, this pink backdrop. Um, now, not, not only do you have to think of that, but you have to get up at five o'clock in the morning to get a picture like this. And then you have to uh, forego your breakfast. Maybe they've made some sandwiches at the B&B &B for you. You have to drive to the location. You have to walk some way. You have to set everything up and you have to wait for the right light. And it doesn't always happen. The mist could be too much. The mist could be non-existent. Luckily on this occasion, it was just right. Okay, um, when, when you're taking portraits, uh, you, you want to make sure that the person is in focus. And um, quite often mobile phone cameras and, and high-end, nearly all the new digital cameras now, you can actually uh, point on your screen, your touch screen, where you want the focus to be. Now, when I took this, I didn't, I just focused on him. And in the background, because I wanted her to be just as a background figure, 
uh, was obviously out of focus. On the right, and also you can see um, he's sort of on the third, on the right hand side, and the rest of the picture is darker and not distracting. The, uh, the, the woman here at one of these events, these Tough Mudder events, um, her face is right on in focus, catch lies in her eyes, but the background is blurred just the way you want it, nothing distracting. Even if there was somebody running in the background, and there might even be somebody there on just above her shoulder on the left, you can't tell because it's totally out of focus. Street photography. Okay, on the left here is uh, in Rush Home on Curry Mile at Eid. Always very colourful. I've been to quite a few Eid celebrations um, over the years. I've been taking photographs in Rush Home. And uh, I just thought this was a funny picture because all you can see is the shoes of the woman carrying, I think it's a woman, or oh, might have been a man, carrying all these balloons. So uh, um, you, again, you're looking for fun and it's out on the street and you've got to have your camera ready. Click, you've got it. The one on the right is a bit more a sad situation. I was in uh, Paris, uh, Janet and I were in Paris, uh, actually and um, uh, with my camera club and we'd gone the South Manchester Camera Club and we'd, we'd gone there to take photographs and to so see, see some exhibitions. But that was the, on the Friday, that was the night of that awful uh, terrorist attack. And, um, and so we went back to our uh, hotels and the next day Paris was virtually closed. So we just walked around. But in Montmartre, in the centre of Paris, um, this, this man was just playing mournful, songs, which is very appropriate uh, after the awful things that happened. Okay, um, then documentary photography, which is what I'm doing in Rush Home with uh, um, Michael Baker. Um, this is, again, you're walking along and uh, this was a, a, a restaurant or, or a dessert place. It was called Love. I think it was called Love. And um, it doesn't, it's not there anymore. Uh, it's changed, they change very quickly, the places around. And uh, it's probably a shisha bar now. And um, and he was just, you know, sort of asking for money. He had his uh, uh, his cup there and uh, I, I, I put some money in. I said, can I take your photograph? And he was, yeah, okay. But uh, you can see he's on the third. The, the colors are quite interesting. And also we've got this word love here. So it's like the cup of love, isn't it? Something to, um, it sort of fits the picture. There's a narrative that goes with the rest of the picture. Again, event photography, the Chinese New Year. I could have included a, a MacFest picture here when I do the event photography um, for the, um, the MacFest, or I have done in the past. So, um, but you've got to be quick with these things and you've got to take control. You've got to ask people, right, all look at me because I wasn't the only person with a camera. There were lots of people with mobile phones thinking this is a really good um, photo opportunity, but then that would have spoiled my picture. So um, I have to be bossy at times. Uh, I don't do wildlife photography. This is a place up in um, Lank near Lancaster. And, um, uh, sorry, just and, um, uh, and there's butterflies in this butterfly house. And they're all still, except when they occasionally fly around. So it's really easy to take pictures like this with um, a lens which throws the background out and just keeps the, um, um, the butterfly's wings in focus. But remember, you've got to take them when they are at right angle, at, you know, their, their, their wings are directly facing the lens because uh, anything at an angle would be out of focus. Okay. Um, uh, photojournalism. Um, uh, uh, I've been on quite a few um, de demonstrations, um, you know, sort of and, and, uh, stop the Iraqi war and all sorts of things over the years. And I always take my camera with me. And uh, and and as, as you can probably guess, I'm uh, I'm I'm not a fan of Brexit, but um, uh, whatever the case is, um, there's. There are instances like this which make good photographs. So here we've got Gina Miller, Tony Robinson and Carolyn Lucas, three well-known people in one shot there. So photojournalism is something that you can do and you can even sell these pictures on uh, things like Alamy and, and Getty. Um, there you go. Uh, 
I don't really do fashion photography. It's just this is one of the singers you saw before in the um, uh, the polka dot uh, d dresses, the three women. And she also makes the dresses. So uh, she wanted to uh, sell her dresses as well. So she just came for that. Um, I, I've done lots of weddings over the years and I like to, to do unusual pictures as well as the straightforward group pictures, which you've got to have. But um, this is during the, uh, probably the best man's speech. And he probably said something really stupid. And she's just um, laughing. So it's not like she's got second thoughts about getting married. It's, uh, uh, it's just a moment. And it's, uh, I'll talk about it later on, but there's a thing in photography called the decisive moment. It's the moment when it's just right for that picture. Any moment where it's, it's just like that or, it, or over the face, it wouldn't have worked. It just had to be that. Um, uh, I also uh, can make pictures on my computer and a, a lot of younger people these days are really good at uh, manipulating pictures on uh, the computers. Even TikTok um, um, have uh, filters and things for manipulating pictures. Um, my, my son, he, w he works for an advertising company. He makes some of these um, uh, these filters like, like we can use on TikTok. And so well, I use the old fashioned method of, of getting three pictures. Um, I, all these skyscrapers went there together. Uh, I pinched one from somewhere else and I put a different sky in. So the whole thing looks uh, a better picture. I could have put a plane in as well if I'd wanted to. On the right hand side, um, the, um, the, the young woman there, uh, Samantha, and she um, is a goth as you, you might imagine. And um, this, it was at an event in Whitby and they have a, a used to twice a year, they have a, a goth weekend and photographers flock there because they all want their photographs taken. taken. And um, so you do that. But usually they're surrounded by lots of other photographers and people. So they're really busy pictures. So what I did was to cut her out and, uh, and in a, um, a place nearby in sea houses, there was a pub there and I found they put ship's clocks on the wall. So I took a picture of that and um, and put the two together. Okay, so being creative, you've got to know your camera. And I hope I've directed you a little bit towards some of the things you need to know. So you need to know about the exposure triangle, don't you? You need to know how much light you're bringing into the camera. And there's three ways to control that. You know how to compose your picture and put things on the third or have lead in lines. Um, so you need to have those, know your compositional rules and perhaps break them as well occasionally. Uh, just to be a bit awkward or to be different and don't always shoot from um i'm i'm just six foot so if i'm taking pictures that they're all when i'm standing up they're all just a couple of inches below by my eye um but if i'm taking photographs of children then i need to get right down on my knees and it hurts sometimes i'll, I'll take around a piece of plastic to um a foam foam rubber to lean on, to kneel down on Anyway, so uh, I shoot upwards and uh, downwards, all sorts of ways. Take lots of shots and pick the, the best. Okay, so being creative, which you need to use all those things, maybe even tripods. Um, um, and people use um, those Griller tripods with uh, um, mobile phones. You can have little clamps to hold them together. Um, people use them for videoing, but also for doing uh, time exposures, all sorts of things can be experimented with. Um, and I use Photoshop and Lightroom, which are the Adobe um, things for what we call post-processing. Post means after, processing means getting the light right, changing a few things, putting in another skyscraper, changing the sky, uh, or making it black and white, whatever, all those things. Um, and you can also do panoramas. So I'll show you a few more things here. Um, I use on my, my phone, my Android phone, a thing called Snapseed, which is a free uh, thing. I'll show you how I use that. But uh, iPhones, my, my son has an iPhone and he told me there's, there's manual apps which are already built into some of these. So um, uh, I mean, I, don't, I, don't, I can't speak personally about iPhones. 
Um, the other day I thought I need to give an example of, uh, of Android Snapseed app. So I was sitting on the couch and there's Tinkerbell, our cat, and I just took a photograph on the, uh, the, the arm, the chair of the arm, uh, the arm of the chair and with a, a biscuit barrel in the background there and the curtains. But you can see what's wrong with it. If I was, um, if I was to ask Kayser, what's wrong with that picture? Doesn't matter. It's, it's too yellow, isn't it, on the left hand side? Yes, so, it is. You're right. Absolutely. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm still pretending I'm uh, teaching a class of, um, of, of real students and I'd be including them as much as possible. I'm You're sorry. okay. You can include me. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I can't include anybody else out there. Um, but um, it's too yellow. So what I did was to um, pull up the app uh, Snapseed and um, you, you can go in and you can do all sorts of things. You can crop it. I could just crop out the uh, just the head um, or I can change the white balance in this case and I can make it um, better white light. And you can see on the right hand side what I did. I also reduced the colors a little bit to make it um, a little bit more uh, a little bit more washed out but uh, it ends up being a much nicer picture. Okay, um, this is up in Sands End, up in the nor um, northeast uh, of England. And um, th these are dead, really easy to do. I've got a tripod, the tides, uh, well, might be coming in, but I'm very conscious of the tide. Don't do this uh, without being aware of the tides because uh, you could get uh, washed away or stranded or something. So uh, this has to be done carefully or with a responsible adult. And um, and I had Wellingtons on and my tripod and the water was swishing in and out around my, my, my Wellingtons and tripod. And I had uh, a very dark filter put on, on my camera lens, which means I can have very long exposures, 30 seconds. And it means that I get all this... Um, misty look to it and uh, it's an amazing picture phil absolutely stunning uh, it, it's uh, and uh, well it, uh, thank you and um, but it's it's it, what i say is it's not that difficult to do once you've got it set up and you've got the the filter um and you you give it 30 seconds and i just guess the exposure i may have done 20 seconds to start with and i thought not enough try 30 seconds and then i may i may try 50 seconds and oh, it's too much. So this is the best one of it. But um, obviously you need a tripod, you need a camera which you can put a, a filter on it. But um, again, I can explain to people if they want to do that, how to do it another time. Um, again, this is uh, something I took on the Manchester Ship Canal um, uh, in between sort of Manchester and Stratford, Salford and Stratford Way. And I was going for a walk along that and I saw all the graffiti, which is always good for taking photographs, and it changes so often. Um, uh, they, they must use a masses of uh, spray paint on these things. Uh, anyway, I thought this, I want something to be in the right hand side. So I walked, started off at photograph one, then I went about, um, you know, a dozen, half a dozen uh, space, paces and did another photograph, another half a dozen paces, and I was right just in the right place. So I then waited, and then a, a few people came by and I took the odd picture, but this was uh, really good because she was in, in red, she was on a bicycle, and, uh, and then I took it back and I stitched it together. And stitching together in Photoshop is not that difficult. Um, and some cameras do this as well. Um, again, something which is so easy to do uh, is our reflections, and um, and when you go into when you can go into town, or uh, when you can travel about a bit more, or even in your local area, but uh, it always looks good with um, uh, rather grand buildings. There's usually lots of glass on modern architecture, and uh, some of it's curved, and some of it's you know the, the glass is a bit sort of wavy as well, and you can get all this wonderful effect, this sort of fluid effect. Okay, uh, when you've um, taken all your pictures and you've done all those things I've said, um, then you want to show it to people. So a lot of people are doing Photoshop, sorry, 
Facebook, uh, Twitter, Instagram, and that's great. But make sure you've, you've, you've got your best pictures out. Don't put everything out. Put your best ones out um, because um, you, you want people to see a few good pictures, not lots of average ones. Um, I've got a website. I also, in the early days, used Flickr, which is um, you can have free Flickr. Uh, I pay a small amount to get professional Flickr, which means I can put more pictures on, but it's a good way of sharing pictures with people. Prints, I love prints. And, um, and I also like making photo books. And, um, and that's a really good way of not having photo albums. People tend not to have those now, but photo books, you can choose the best pictures. Um, to improve your photography even more, join a camera club like the South Manchester Camera Club. Just Google that and it comes up. Uh, obviously, they don't meet in a place at the moment, but they have things online like this. And you'd have a speaker like me, um, or you'd have a, a competition evening where you can show your pictures. Uh, so it's a really good way of, of getting in. I've learned so much from the camera club. Um, and also taking part in competitions. It makes you work harder. And a lot of those pictures I've shown you, I've done really well in competitions. See, I'm only showing you my best pictures. I'm not showing you my worst pictures. I'm, I wouldn't do that. Um, I, I also, uh, th things like accreditation and things, I'm a member of the Royal Photographic Society. And that's really good because it's, um, uh, it, I guess, a really good uh, magazine each uh, month. And uh, it, it, uh, it's, I, I had to reach a very high standard to get that and that makes you work harder and that's what you want to do um there's some famous photographers and most people have heard of cartier bresson uh Kaiser, have you heard of cartier bresson yes i have yes yes excellent uh, and, and nearly everybody's heard of david bailey of course <laughs> yes. uh, and uh, he was a famous photographer in the in the sort of 60s 70s uh taking pictures of twiggy and kate moss and whatever um and so um and just at the bottom of the page here, keep learning by going to YouTube because um, we all learn by YouTube. You, you, you know everything. Something on YouTube, somebody's telling you more and more what you need to know. So th this is just now. These this is a Cartier Bresson picture on the left. Um, when I'm lo looking at this, I'm thinking this is one of the most famous pictures in the world, and I'm thinking, why is this? it's not a brilliant picture? But um, because that guy is just in midair, jumping, and there's got the reflection there, it's towards the right-hand side, sort of on the third, but there's lots of messy bits in the background. But he took that at the right moment. And remember, he couldn't do it with a digital camera and going click, 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 click. Um, it was just, he had a film, and film's expensive, so he probably went click, and then that's it. And that he got the picture at that moment, the decisive moment. David Bailey, he um, he's he's quite an extrovert photographer, and uh, he would do things which are not um, a sort of out of the box, uh, not usual. And he would crop his pictures. Part of the head's missing. It's really tight crop, but that's his way of doing things. Uh, so anything's possible. And, uh, you know, he's a famous rich photographer, so uh, uh, anything can sometimes go. Okay, um, as I said originally, keep looking at famous paintings or other people's photographs. I, um, look at the pictures in the newspaper. I, I told you I'm not really interested in sports photography, but I look at sports photographs because you can. some of them are so good that the way that they um, have composed. And um, uh, Leonardo, he, he had a compositional theme here. And there's, um, there's a mathematician uh, of that sort of, that, that, that was uh, uh, 16th century um, uh, Fibonacci. And he had this kind of spiral and things can sort of fit into that. Also on the right hand side here, a bit gruesome. Sorry about that, but um, uh, she, she's a, a, a famous uh, female uh, classical artist, which uh, is good to uh, to show. Um, and she she is um, using triangles here. And some of my pictures, I like to think I've got triangles in them. Okay. 
So keep taking lots of pictures and be your first critic before you show other people because uh, uh, you, you're the first editor person to do it. Okay, as I said, you can get any information from Kaiser or MacFest. Uh, if you want to get in touch with me, um, I, if, if, you, uh, if, if you Google F Phil Porter's website, there's only, I have to say, there's only one Phil Porter's out there, I think. Um, so um, you can easily find me or ask Kaiser. Okay, now I'm going to look at the, uh, are there any sort of questions about the, the first part? Or do you want to go on to the next bit now? Yes, there is one uh, uh, posted by one of our team members, Hanan. She said, as you said, the rule of thirds is, it, uh, is important, but are there other rules for better shot composition and framing? Rules um, about better shot composition and framing. Uh, right, well, I, I've... Um, uh, that, that uh, the, the golden mean... Uh, getting things um, which is uh, well, uh, th there's things like with sky. If you have the sky right in the middle of a uh, a picture, then that that looks a bit too 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 even. So people try to have two thirds sky and one third beach or land, or the other way around, one third sky and and two thirds uh, whatever the beach or the the land in foreground. So you you can play around with those kind of things. Um, uh, so th 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 they're the sort of, um, uh, and the Fibonacci's uh, spiral is the, the other one I was um, uh, mentioning there. And um, uh, if you look on my YouTube uh, site, Phil, if you Google Phil Porter's YouTube, um, there is a little um, film on Fibonacci's um, uh, spiral. So that's an, another little sort of compositional uh, uh, trick there. But lead-in lines uh, are always good. Color uh, compositional aids um, are the main thing. Okay. So shall I go on to the next bit? Yeah, yes, please. Thank you. Uh, okay. Um, right, now... Um, um, Kaiser asked me, um, well, uh, ages ago, uh, when she was planning MacFest, um, for, for uh, an exhibition um, similar to the one we did uh, a few years ago uh, with some of the new pictures, um, which were going to then sh promote the exhibition at the Central uh, Ref Library, which was supposed to be uh, all of April and May. But... Obviously, so many things are being cancelled. Uh, we had to cancel it because just w w either it wasn't open or there would not have been enough people going to see it. Um, so we thought, my, Michael Baker and myself thought, the best thing to do is something we can do is to make a book of what would be in the exhibition. Uh, we have been given another date for the exhibition, but that's going to be in um, uh, 2023. So it's, it's quite a way off. So I thought a book is a good idea to, um, um, uh, to, to, to show what we've been doing. Okay, um, the, the, the exhibition, the, 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 sorry, the, the, the book, this is like a preview of the book, um, is looking at what uh, Michael and myself have been doing over the last four years. Um, originally, uh, we met um, uh, Hanif Bobat, uh, from the Ethnic Health Forum, and he's, he has worked uh, within Rush Home for many years. And it's a very, very valuable uh, service, helping um, people, perhaps um, people immigrating, uh, immigrants or people moving into the area and helping with passport information, all, all sort of general things which uh, people, new, people new to the area need to know. And um, so, but he's been noticing, as he said to us, how it's been changing. Um, in 2000, there were 50 curry houses, like the uh, Shere Khan or the um, um, uh, uh, Sanam. And now there's very few of those uh, proper original curry houses, and mainly it's shisha bars. Uh, he's saying perhaps we shouldn't call it curry mile, perhaps we should call it shisha mile. So Michael and myself thought, well, yes, we, we want to, he, he wanted us to take some photographs of what it was like now. But we thought there's a whole project in this and we can then start asking people what they think about the changes and how uh, it's going to 
um, I, I could change in the future. So, um, uh, so, 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 yeah, so uh, we, we started taking more and more photographs. Um, on the left there, so Curry Mile, um, a local school, Hill Place um, Primary School, uh, they asked us if we could go in and, um, and help out with a lesson. Now, me being a, an ex-geography uh, teacher, uh, this was uh, uh, no problem for me. And I, the first thing you do is think of a map. And, uh, and then uh, we had lots of little pictures of the fronts of the, uh, the various establishments. Um, and quite often the people, we got them to stand outside the, the, the owner or the people who worked in front of their restaurant or shop. And so then the students then would have the picture, they'd have the name and they'd have to sort of tie everything together. And then we'd talk about how many different types of shops there were. So it was a good exercise, visual. And, but it's also, uh, it tells us a lot um, as a documentary project, what's happening. Okay, um, traditionally, as I said, in, uh, in, the, in the 90s, um, there were about 50 curry houses. Uh, my favorite um, was the Punjab, uh, which, was, um, which was Indian and, uh, and all vegetarian. I'm vegetarian and uh, I just loved the dosas and all the other stuff. It was, uh, but that, that went along with a lot of others. And, and it's sort of been, the Sanam is one of the very oldest ones. And uh, I think it was called Sanam Sweet House, but um, it's had a, a coat of paint and a new sign at the moment. But the one on the left there is uh, My Lahore, which is, uh, is about, about uh, nine years old, started about nine years ago. And uh, so, but it's carrying on in that tradition. Okay, um, Curry Mile, we could call it Fusion Mile because there's lots of different foods you can get now. Um, lots of Middle Eastern and uh, North African, East African people migrated to uh, the UK and a lot, some came to Manchester and they, they started um, setting up restaurants in and around Rush Home. And so some of the, uh, the curry houses started to move out and uh, so we had kebabs and um, uh, and all the different kinds of food from uh, Iran and Syria and uh, it's just made a, a wonderful um, array of food and, and uh, this guy here uh, Ahmad he makes delicious folded over cheese flatbreads they're really nice and um, uh, everybody's so generous here I mean uh, Michael and myself we spent a long lots of time going walking around and we'll go into a, a cafe or a um, a restaurant or wherever and we take some pictures and, and we're showing the pictures and they say you can have the pictures if you want and they always give us some mint tea or or something to eat and uh, it's not what we intended to do but um, it's, it's, it's been it's, it's just uh, really nice to be able to chat with people and to and to, to get to know people um so it could, it could be called kebab mile couldn't it instead of curry mile this this there's yes, it could be. <laughs> there's certainly several kebab places along there. Um, so, um, so, so uh, you know, everybody is so uh, warm and helpful and, uh, and gives us lots of information and chats and um, uh, where people come from and, uh, and, um, and their families. And it's, it may be a sensitive thing to ask people, but uh, it's important to understand the whole dynamics of uh, how things have been moving and changing. Uh, it could be called Barber Mile. Maybe I need to go to the barbers. <laughs> yes, at the moment. <laughs> well, I've got a lot of lockdown locks. Um, but um, uh, there's about 12 barbers along there, um, mostly Kurdi of Kurdish origin. And, um, and they're also friendly and they, uh, they say, come in, come in, I was taking photographs. And, uh, and, um, and the, the, the guy on the left there, um, Shaban uh, is Syrian and he lived in Aleppo and he was so happy to come over to the UK as a safe place as he said uh, Adam on the right there cutting the hair he's, fr he's from um, uh, from Palestine and in the shop there it was like United Nations there was, there was even somebody from South South America there was uh, from um, from Syria um, Iraq. It was they. They're all working together here, and it's it's, it's wonderful. Um, obviously, it could be called Shopping Mile because it's always been a Shopping Mile High Street, 
and and here we've got photographs now but um of um hull meat and uh, typical uh, vegetables to go into uh, middle eastern uh, cooking um but uh, it, they used to have shoe shops and bicycle shops and Bel as it, there was a belgium chocolate shop uh which is now the ravi food store and uh that was there because in Victoria Park, which is just around the corner, there's, there's some really big villas, houses, mansions. And um, at the early part of last century, um, quite a lot of um, uh, German Jewish people came over to the UK for reasons that you, you, you'll know. And um, so, and some of them were wealthy and they could buy these big houses in this um, gated um, park area, Victoria Park. And so this, you can imagine this Belgium uh, chocolate place was very popular. So, and they had toy shops when people, when children played with toys rather than play computer games and uh, haberdashery when people sewed on um, repaired socks instead of throwing them away. So there you are. So things have changed and that's what we're trying to ask people. Again, it could be called dessert mile. There's, there's, there, there, there are quite a few Syrian sweet shops and they're absolutely gorgeous the way they present the stuff they, they, these beautiful nutty sweet um, uh, well they're like flapjacks but they've got other names and uh, so they're really proud of these shops and they're spotless this other one on the right hand is Moonlight a place called Moonlight it's been there a long time and they sell ice creams and this man on the right here he lives in Oldham now with his family, his wife and uh, two children. And him and his wife, before they had children, came down to Curry Mile um, at weekends maybe to have a curry or whatever. And um, so but then, now they live in Oldham and they still come down, or they used to come down when they could, um, once a month or so, and they bring the children. So they have a curry for old time's sake and an ice cream for the kids. Win-win. Um, it could be called Golden Mile, I suppose, but um, there, there are several uh, quite high-class, high-status jewellery shops along there, and um, uh, they've been there for quite a while. I think in the very early days, uh, certainly in the uh, in the nineties, a lot of these places set up. I, I like this one on the right here because um, I'm, I'm just looking in the window, and there's me with a camera and uh, expecting him to say, go away, you shouldn't be taking photographs of, of the jewellery here. Um, but he, he sort of gave a big smile and I took the picture. But if you look, I didn't notice this until afterwards, but if you look in the top left, if you can see it, it says, no photography. Oops. Shh, don't tell anyone. Yeah. Um, there's um, also, it could be called Fashion Mile as well. There's some really high class uh, fashion shops along there uh, for, uh, for, for Asian, Middle East, Eastern um, clothes and uh, uh, they're lovely people to talk to and, and their stories. So some of the stories we've got uh, at the end of the book. Um, and um, uh, Ali here on the right, uh, a lovely man. Um, he, 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 uh, was, he was born in Pakistan. He, um, he, he, he traveled the world doing various jobs, came to, to Manchester and eventually now has become the, the manager of um, of uh, Junad Jamshed, this this Asian clothes shop. But the the owner of of it, I can't remember his name now. Perhaps Kajra knows. It, it is a, a Pakistani pop, uh, pop star, and he had a bit of extra money, and he's put it into his clothing business. So um, I think it's Junaid. Uh... Yes, yes. It's the story. The story is in the book when it comes out. Okay, Eid, again, we've seen this photograph on the right before. Uh, Eid is a, um, a festival celebration and people get dressed up and, uh, and, and some of the lads, they get really dressed up and they put on the big watches and they drive around uh, in um, um, sort of ludicrously large cars, open top, uh, loud music going away. We're here, can you see us? Can you hear us? And, uh, and they're, they're having a great time and um, they're really good for photographs. Uh, so um, again, that's what they're doing and glorious. I think that's, that should be what uh, the, the title of the picture is. Um, 
again, another festival, uh, the Shia Muslims here with the Ashura. Um, it's not a festival, it's a, a pr 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 um, procession. And, um, and, and so there's more pictures in the, in the book about this. And the, the, the men, they, uh, they, they traditionally, they beat their chest and uh, sometimes a little bit of blood is seen, um, but uh, not too much. But uh, this is, uh, uh, they meet up on plat fields and, uh, and we're chatting with them. And, uh, and they, the gentleman whose picture's in the book, um, he's been carrying the, the banner for um, oh, like 50 years, I think. Um, now, um, there were several pubs, um, public houses along Curry Mile. Um, but uh, these have all slowly disappeared. And um, um, the, um, uh, there's, one, there's uh, one which was called the Clarence Pub. Uh, it is now Pasha's, a uh, shisha bar. Um, the, 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 uh, there's another one which was called the Huntsman Pub. And now that's being turned into a, a shisha bar. Um, so there has been less need for, for pubs in the area and certainly the lockdown hasn't helped and the very last pub that closed uh, was the the Albert which um, I remember when I from when I was a student at Manchester University and um, th th this was a football pub because uh, main road the city grounds were just down the road and every Saturday um, people would come down the landlady her story is in the back of the book as well uh, the landlady said to us that um, she could almost just open on a Saturday and close for the rest of the week because the taking she got on a Saturday was enough um, to, to carry her through. But obviously she had beer to sell and uh, she was a tenant, so she had to keep open. So, so that, that's just another interesting story. And the pub closed last September. Um, there you go. Um, uh, this just illustrates what it was like during the first lockdown when everything was just totally closed. There was hardly anybody about. Um, again, some uh, black and white pictures. Uh, these were obviously taken in colour, but um, uh, some pictures work better in black and white. And uh, so the ones on the right, the three lads, three people, um, and that, that was just taken with a long... Uh, no, no, I think it was taken with um, a hundred mil lens, one hundred five mil lens, and then I just cropped the bit out in the middle. The one in the middle was taken by Michael, and um, uh, that, that's um, uh, Abdullah at the um, uh, at the Ravi food store, and uh, uh, he, he was very conscious about his health because he he'd had some some issues prior to all this, so he was very conscious about not catching COVID. The, the uh, one on the left there I quite like because um, it's, it's, it's got the, the masks, hasn't it? They're, they're, everybody's wearing masks and um, except the guy in I noticed the guy in the back there, that isn't. So this was during, I think one of the Eid, yes, one of the Eid celebration evenings. Um, again, yes, We've got 10 minutes left and we do oh, have two three questions. Right, right. okay, we're nearly finished now. Good, thank you. Oh, fascinating, I can't believe what I'm seeing, mashallah. So, 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 so again, these are, in fact, these are some of Michael's pictures here of um, uh, the, uh, the Sanam and uh, the Walnut Bakery, which uh, uh, he, he's, uh, he also runs a, a restaurant himself, Michael uh, um, Cromer in, Ch in, um, in Didsbury. And so he's very interested in the catering side of things. So he's, he likes to get in there and get some pictures. Um, but here you can see that they're only selling a uh, takeaway food. Um, all right, is it gonna be called Shisha Mile, not Curry Mile? Um, again, this is a bone of contention because um, Shisha is not good for you. It's still smoke, it's still particulates in your lungs. And uh, uh, so the councillor, um, um, Robin Nevoir, is, is, um, is not really keen on the shisha bars, but, um, but when you talk to people at shisha bars, they say, well, look, this is the only place that young people can go to. 
uh, there's no alcohol. They they have they just drink coke or coffee or tea, and uh, then they've got the the shisha outside. So it's 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 how you think about it. Um, again, I, t I love taking portraits, so I've got hundreds of these portraits. Um, and that, that guy there was um, um, wishing me a Mubarak mate on the left there. And you can see the background is all out of focus. And you can see, can you see the triangle between his, his hand, his arm there going up to his head, down with the jacket with the red there. There's a triangle in that picture. All right, moving on. You can't read these. Uh, I, it's not meant to. This is just showing you at the back of the book the stories by the uh, jo jo Joanne, uh, the, Al the manager of the Albert, um, uh, Mohammed Abdullah Barry at the Ravi food store. Um, and then Ravnavaz Akbar, the councillor, um, he gave us a lovely interview, great interview, and that's really interesting to uh, listen to. Um, that, that's um, Michael and myself out there taking pictures. We, we've thoroughly enjoyed doing this project, and uh, I hope we've captured what's going on. Everybody's been wonderful. And as I said, we, we, we never pay for a single cup of mint tea, and that wasn't the intention. But it's so lovely to talk to people and hear their stories. And um, I'm in the process of finishing the book, uh, some of these pages you've seen today are from the book, and um, it should be out in a few months' time. And uh, I'll, um, I'll pass it on to Kaiser and we'll see if we can uh, get the information around because uh, it, it, there's lovely stories in there and, and some, some great pictures. So uh, there we go. Um, all right, wise words. Uh, you don't take a photograph. This is by Ansel Adams, a famous American photographer. You make it. So all what I've been saying, you, you make the picture. You don't just flick your camera or anywhere. You look at the exposure, you decide on the composition and you make that picture. And that's what Ansel Adams did. And he, he did some fantastic pictures. Can you see how the, the Snake River literally snakes towards the mountains? And, and there you go. Um, Thank you so much. Uh, that's Phil, it. What an amazing feast, my goodness. I've written in the chat uh, your relationship with MacFest. We ex showed the exhibition of the marvelous uh, exhibition you had in the first year. Last year, you took lots of photographs for us. And this year, we were going to have a proper exhibition in the marquee where we normally have it, as well as this workshop. And you managed to combine the two beautifully, so thoroughly done, amazing pictures. I've never seen anything like it. And as a total lay person, a beginner, I've learned so much. And you managed to pack all that in and in very much, very accessible way. So I'm really delighted and honored that you've done this for us. So thank you so much, Phil. Thank you, thank you very much. Minutes left, and I'm going to quickly pack in two or three questions. One from Barbara. She says, can anyone join the South Manchester Camera Club? Uh, yes, um, but I think um, I can't remember what the uh, the younger age sort of uh, threshold is. I don't, I, a sixteen year old can't join it. Um, I think, uh, or, or unless they have parents with them, the, uh, this, you, you'd have to find out about that. I'm not too sure of the regulations, but yes, anybody can join it. You don't even have to take part in any of the uh, uh, competitions. You can just come along and listen. Or, or you can listen online, but yes, anybody can join, and uh, it's it's well worth it. It's a cheap night out. That's what I used to say. Uh, I was um, one of the meet and greet people, and uh, and I hope I haven't put anybody off. Uh, but uh, we had we, we have nearly a hundred members, or sort of ninety members. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you normally get about fifty at a, an evening, and we get really good speakers and. Um, uh, and sometimes members speak like I've spoken at times, and we get really top photographers coming along to to show their stuff. Yeah, anybody can join, join Barbara. Join. Second question is about the pandemic. Uh, the lady, Hanan, she's asking, has, how has photography shaped your experience during the pandemic? So photography, pandemic, what, what's been different for you? Well, well I, obviously, in the, in the early days, uh, I really couldn't go out um, to, to take pictures. There was nobody to take pictures of, and um, I didn't want to put myself at risk. Uh, um, as, oops, hello. I'm still, uh, yeah. Uh, as I, uh, uh, as the year went on, and there was some let uh, sort of 
uh, letdown areas of the pandemic, I did go uh, into Rush Home and I did take some more pictures, like you saw some of the pictures with people with masks on. Um, it has affected my photography because I've taken very few pictures this year. Uh, right. And I've, I've forced myself to go to Rush Home because it's, it is our project. And there were certain pictures I, I needed to get to do the book. Um, as I said, I went into Manchester for the first time in 12 months a few weeks ago. And um, so it's going to take a while to get back into taking photographs uh, and people are going to be more and more conscious. And you can't take, you can only take so many pictures of people with masks on. You don't yeah, know you smiling or not. That's right. Okay. There's one from Maya I really want to get in. Uh, what got you into photography? What got me into photography? Yes. <laughs> um, well, um, I, I, I've been taking photographs since I was um, uh, about 12, and um, I remember seeing a little camera. I've got it, still got it here, um, a little Brownie 127, and it was in the chemist window on the photography side of the doorway. And, uh, and it was um, 99 shillings and nine pence or something. And I wanted, wanted it, and I saved up for it. Uh, for weeks, and then I was still a shilling short, and my dad knew I needed it so much, so he gave me the extra shilling, and I went down, and I got this, and then and obviously some film as well, and that's when I started taking pictures of, of either, um, you know, my family or birds in the garden, so it, it, it was a curiosity of being able to capture things, and then them being able to produce your own pictures by developing them is so, it's like, like magic in the early days, that you actually could actually make something from a plain piece of paper into a wonderful picture. Wow. So it's been very fulfilling for you, obviously. But, but yes, well, I suppose what I must add is that being a, a teacher of geography and geology for all my teaching, 32 years of teaching, um, I always took photographs for my teaching uh, to help explain things. And if, if I felt a lesson was getting a little bit heavy or a little bit sort of te technical, I'd bring out the projector and show some slides. But Still, it's still educational because you can talk about a slide and you can see things on the slide. Like I've shown you photographs, you can learn from photographs. Okay, thank you. I think we're near the end of time, but just a short reply to this one is Hajraj. She was talking about the curry mile, it's changed over the years. She's thinking about the future. What might it look like in another 10 years? according to you <laughs> well, well we we do ask this question when we've been, question. Uh -huh. when we've been giving uh, taking the interviews with people and um, and some some say it's going to remain very similar i think it's going to just have that i think it's going to have that mix uh, like we've got now and i don't think it's going to change that much um th there just may be some there's new types of, there's a, a mexican taco that's just opened um, but when I was talking to the uh, the proprietor, um, they're, they're uh, of Pakistani origin and they're good cooks and they're just cooking Mexican food. So um, uh, and there's an Indian street food which has just opened, and um, uh, and that, that's sort of a new. It's like the new sort of style of eating. So I think it's going to be very similar. Uh, and even um, the, the councillor um, wants to have car parks and things to improve the area. He thinks it's going to still be a, a hub of activity. Thank you so much, Phil. I mean, I'm going to repeat the same thing. It's been an amazing feast for us. Uh, incredible. And uh, thank you for hosting us and offering us this session and your expertise and your amazing pictures. We look forward to your book next year. So for next MacFest, you'll be launching it. But, but, not next year, this year. This year, but our festival will be next year. <laughs> you know, <laughs> MacFest 2022. And of course, be, people who have joined us today, thank you so much for your time. And I hope you enjoyed it as much as I have. And if you have any questions for Phil, as he said, you can write to MacFest and we will forward the questions. The recording is there for Facebook Live page. If you missed the first half, you can go onto MacFest Facebook, join us there, live recording. And then this recording will be on our MacFest YouTube channel as well later. So good evening, everyone. And assalamu alaikum. And th thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you. Goodbye.